So I just met a guy called Rob Sutcliffe at the back and he said, you're the guy, there he is, Rob, he said, you're the guy who's here to tell us what to do with our lives. So that was a nice opening conversation. Um, Rob's recently escaped his own uh, job as a designer developer, um, front end, and is contracting and also spending one day a week doing improv, which is his real passion, his escape. Um, so at the beginning of our escape events, we, um, we ask everyone to stand up and we, we say, right, pick a number in your head between one and ten. One is, I'm just here because my partner dragged me along or for the free coffee, I'm actually not sure what you're talking about. Is this a cult? How do I get out of here? Ten is, I'm out. I, I've, I've escaped my corporate job. I'm on the path towards a life of meaning and purpose and a career on my own terms. Nine is, I'm standing on the edge of the plank and I'm, I'm about to jump. And I thought, well, you know, it works. If it works, do it here. And then I thought, what about this audience? I guess there's a reason you guys are here at 9 a.m. on a Friday, not in a cubicle, so maybe that won't work. But I want to try something anyway. So if I can ask you all to stand up, please. Um, please sit down. If you run your own business, it's a, it's, a, it's a business business, it's a growth startup, it's not just you. Please sit down if you run your own thing. All right? Please sit down if you run a sort of one-person business. You are your business, freelance portfolio career. You all got jobs. Okay. <laughs> Please sit down if you do a job, you work in a job, you enjoy it, it makes you tick, you're very happy there, you're not thinking about leaving. All right. The rest of you guys, you're my people. Welcome, don't worry about the rest of them. Right, let's do this. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can do this. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm glad I didn't wear the Christmas jumper I was going to wear, because none of you are either, and I would have felt like an idiot. Um, that's not a Christmas jumper, that's just jazz. Okay, fair enough. I've got a, a, a Christmassy tie on. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, I want to take you back to December 2008, and I'm sitting in a grey cubicle um, over in a grey building, probably on a grey day over at London Bridge. I'm working in consulting, one of the big four, and... Um, the computer's gray, I'm wearing gray, I feel gray. <laughs> and I'm researching customer service for probably, I think it was British Gas. I'm just online, I'm researching. And the world was crumbling um, uh, uh, down around us. And I was like a few years into my, my, my career. And um, the thing about consultants is actually they do really well in recessions because everyone's cut slashing costs and they say, come in and you know, run these numbers. And guess what, you're actually deciding who gets fired. I mean, not me, I'm just the, the monkey on the spreadsheet and then the people above me. So, it, the work wasn't meaningful for me. In fact, it was kind of often the op opposite. Um, and I found myself, the crazy thing about a corporate job is you can kind of do two hours work a day and yeah. And so I would be reading all this stuff online and I stumbled across a, a PDF by Seth Godin called The Idea Virus. And it was so interesting. It was about how ideas spread. And I didn't know what a startup was. I didn't know that someone in their late 20s could build something online, whether or not as a business, let alone a community. And the idea virus really caught my imagination um, in such a way that I kind of, I just picked up this thread and began pulling at it and I started subscribing to blogs, most of them in the States, some of them about quitting your corporate job, but mostly around spreading ideas, um, creativity, business, startups. And the contrast between the world that I was in, physically in, and what I was wearing and I was at a drinks party once, I was talking to this girl and, and she said, what do you do? You know, we all hate that question said, I'm a management consultant. I obviously didn't say it with, you know, the same levels of energy as Victoria's got this morning. And she said to me, don't take this the wrong way, but you look like one. And yeah, ouch. So I go home, shave my head, and like, it wasn't that I minded looking like one, I minded being one. So um, I want to talk to you about two worlds. Um, the world that I was in when I was sitting in that gray building over there six years ago, um, and, and the world of education that, that had prepared me for that world. So that's a linear trajectory. We call it the travelator, right? You're kind of on it, and you're not even moving. You're being carried along. Um, and then the world that I guess we're talking about, we're all here, we're all engaged in one form or other, which is the world of creativity and meaning and career on your own terms. Freedom for me is choosing your own constraints. It's not having no constraints at all. And when I clocked that there was this other world, it just was a matter of time. How am I going to get there? Um, and 
One of the things I've noticed, and one of the reasons why I think Escape the City resonates with people, is that we can see, especially the revolution that we're living through, we can see how other people are living their lives. We can access all these ideas. But we can't necessarily get there. And we've been trained and prepared to get in a box, frankly, and then jump from that box to the next box and the next box, and mainly on other people's agenda. And my hypothesis is that our aspirations have leapt forward much faster than the institutions within most of us operate have. So what I mean by that is individuals want to work differently, but the reality of most jobs just doesn't align to that. And as a result, you get a lot of pain. You get a lot of friction. You get a lot of people feeling like a square peg in a round hole. And, and if today's about education, I want to talk about the difference between being prepared for the old world, and it is the old world, um, and this new world, which isn't as clear, and no one's giving us permission, and no one's saying, oh, here's a really well-paid job full of meaning, creativity, and independence, for the most part. Um, so I want to talk about the contrast between those two worlds. Um, and I have two, two areas I want to touch on. The first is, what's the difference between those two worlds in terms of mindset? Um, and I'm going to share my story, because that's what I know. That's my truth. Um, and then secondly, I want to open up some thoughts around a dilemma I have, um, around how can you teach the new world stuff, which I, I will get to that. And the reason I want your input on that, and I'll share where I'm at on it, is because along with Becca and Matt, two of my colleagues at the Escape School, we're building a 21st century school. It, it's nothing like a school apart from in name, but it's an education and community space. It's 100 meters from the Bank of England. Um, it's about as subversive as it gets, I guess. Um, and it's 3,000 square feet. And it's full of people who want to, like the guys who are standing up at the end, want to figure out that transition. And my dilemma is, I think a lot of this stuff can't be taught. I'm five and a half years into my own journey. Last corporate salary I earned was July 2009, good old days. And since then, I've invented you know, the job and then the salary at times. And what it's taken me five and a half years to get to where I am today, and I'm on a journey, and, and, and you know, I'm on it, but I'm by no means there. And so the dilemma, the, the catch-22 for me is, how can you create a school around something that has to be experienced directly through lived experience? And that's what I want to talk to you guys about a bit. OK, back to the cubicle. Feeling externally successful. Well, not even feeling it, but externally successful, right? CV, oh, well done. Grades, corporate job, promotion. Like, and all of these things left me feeling cold. Empty, like kind of like a fraud, like, OK, um, I guess arbitrarily this is good stuff, but why don't I feel it? Um, internally feeling a little bit, a little bit, a little bit gray, a little bit unfulfilled, asking myself some big questions. Um, and kind of thinking, this is crazy, 27 years old, and you've never, in terms of like mainstream education and career, you've never really achieved anything that you've really felt. Um, so as luck would have it, the guy in the next door cubicle leans over and goes, this is a bit crap, isn't it? <laughs> Enter my business partner, Dom. So two like-minded souls who, I mean, we'd be talking to each other, literally just talking. You know what a cubicle farm's like, just like you stand up, and as far as you can see, it's people with their heads down, tapping away um, at spreadsheets. And people would be looking at us like, what are those guys doing over there? Talking? Showing their character and personality? So anyway, long story short, we came up with lots of awful business ideas. Um, there was the work shirt rental company um, where you don't buy shirts, you just rent them. And like, forget sweat patches, it doesn't matter. You get all the colors and patterns in the world. And then there was the hangover recovery service where we were going to scoot around London on scooters, delivering Bloody Marys on weekends, ice packs, paracetamol. Someone actually started that recently. So I don't know if it sort of reached them or they came up with the idea independently. Then we realized that the idea that we were feeling, um, sorry, the emotion that we were feeling was potentially the idea, as in, isn't it crazy that all these educated, fortunate, privileged people are climbing ladders, doing work, being paid above average for it, doing work that ultimately leaves them feeling unfulfilled? What a waste. What a shame. Um, another book by Seth Godin. I feel, kind of feel like he's my puppeteer sometimes. I read Tribes by Seth Godin, which is this idea of two guys in their mid to late 20s with an idea, what leverage, what clout do they have? No one's going to return their calls. No one's going to pay them any attention. Two guys and 50,000 people signed up to the movement, who feel the same way, maybe we've got something. So for us, it was community first, business second. And without the community, we don't have a business. 
So we're a problem-focused business. We're trying to solve our own problem, frankly, and then it just snowballed into this, this thing that ended up kind of taking us rather than us taking it. We started a blog. The blog turned into a, um, a blog plus meetups and a newsletter. And then employers started saying, hey, what's your rate card? Can we post jobs on your site? Sort of hand over the receiver. Don, what's our rate card? What is a rate card? Um, and you know, classic, I mean, it really was unintentional. So year one was just like, we're free. We can pay rent, just. And then year two was, OK, if we're going to give this half a decade a decade, let's get serious about it. We need to get away from this kitchen table, get out of our pajamas, stop eating Weetabix three times a day. <laughs> And because we're getting such an incredible response from around the world. So today, Escape the City has 180,000 members. Half of them are in this country. Many of them email us every week being like, bring this here. And I'm thinking, when you say this, do you have any idea what, you're, what this is? And, but what, a, what an opportunity, right? What a privilege. Um, on this journey, it's become apparent that the way in which we build the business has to be as different as the brand. Otherwise, we're no better than the environment we left. Um, we ended up pitching VCs for our first round of serious investment, and it was just felt so wrong. Like the sort of ridiculous hockey stick graphs, and like, do you want to build a billion dollar business? No. Uh, you know, I did this for freedom and meaning, and yeah, if we can make a decent living and build something valuable out of it, then great. Really funny, oh God, those VC, it was proper Dragon's Den. So we got an offer, incredibly, from one of them, one of London's top VCs. And um, in the, in, whilst getting grilled, they're like two guys in San Francisco, it's like five in the morning in San Francisco, and they're grilling us on this like Skype TV video link. But and, you know, I want to do eye contact with them, but I, I don't know where the thing is. So I'm like, talking, and they're like these questions, and these guys here, the, the two partners. Actually, the two associate um, venture capitalists were um, both Escape the City fans. One had used us, one had read the book, so we we're like, okay, you're on side. Um, little anecdote. This isn't about education at all, but <laughs> I like sharing the story. Um, one of the main partners goes, so, you know, are you guys killers? If you're up for this journey, you've got to be killers. Reed's a killer. I was like, Reed? I was like, reed.co.uk, the job board, they're killers? I mean, I know they're powerful, successful. <laughs> he was talking about Reed Hoffman, the founder of uh, LinkedIn. So I was like, oh, no, I'm not a killer. I'm an idealist. <laughs> so, OK, I, I, I give you that anecdote because over the five years of building this business, we've always had lots of pressure to build a business in the way that you should build a business. And often that goes against our values. Often that's corporate, or at least it's mainstream, one-dimensional one definitions of success. Um, and along the way of building the community and then having a recruitment business model, which matches people with exciting jobs, any job that's not in a big, gray corporate organization, getting people out into startups and social enterprises and abroad and growth businesses. Um, again, uh, pulling at the thread, it's kind of down the rabbit hole, right? The more we worked and the more we spoke to our customers, the more we realized you can't solve this problem with a job board and a newsletter. This goes so deep. This goes to the heart of identity, definitions of success. Um, what do we want out of life? What is meaning? What is purpose? What is work for? And so for me, Dom's like the logical black and white, you know, uh, uh, one, two, three, meat and veg. And I'm thinking about what does this all mean? And he's like, let's just build a business that works. And, and I'm like going down the rabbit hole, realizing that we're speaking to people at our events, and they're coming to us with all of this hope. You know the expression product market fit? So for five years, we've had promise market fit. And our product has been way off. And I'm thinking, this is such a big problem to solve. So we've always done three things, community, job matching, recruitment, and education. And this year, at the beginning of the year, I was driving them nuts on the tech and recruitment side. And they were like, look, Rob, I know you're into the education thing. Go and try and build an education business. So we used to do one, one event a month. We now do about 10 a week. And um, I managed to get this space over in the city. And for the last five months, we've been running sessions talks, workshops, weekend courses, meetups around this concept of transition. We thought it was just for people escaping the city. It turns out it's for people escaping the civil service, it's people escaping the charity sector. You name it, where there's a big organization, an institution, and process in bureaucracy and politics, there are people who want out. And people want independence, autonomy, purpose, meaning wealth on their own terms. Um, coming back around to the education thing. So I was quite and probably are and am still in many ways quite one-dimensional in terms of like high achiever, work really hard, get to the next level. Oh, I'm at the bottom of another ladder, right? Climb to the top. And um, earlier this year, I began to get very frustrated that one of the main, well, the main thing holding me back was me. Um, and what I mean by that 
is, yes, building a business is hard. Yes, managing people is hard. Leading, building products, marketing, all these things are hard, raising investment. We ended up raising 600 grand on Crowdcube from 395 of our own investors, which was an incredible moment. And for us, was that fork in the path where we decided to build a business aligned with our values rather than in terms of how should. So back to that, um, the mindset. Um, I started working with a coach, a leadership coach, John Morgan. Um, and the reason why was because I was fed up getting in my own way, fed up of linear personal growth, month on month, just getting a tiny bit better, a tiny bit more experience, learning a lesson. Or frankly, not even growth, just being me month on month, hustling my way towards building a business. And I think this is at the heart of the education piece, which is my mindset, five years after leaving the city, was still massively stuck in some of those paradigms. Um, so John and I are in a canoe, and we're going from Hampton Court round to Putney on the Thames in June. And he's quite a challenging guy. He's American, and he asks questions like, what do you want, Rob? And I, I like, uh, you just stop giving me such a hard time. And like, he'll ask it 17 times until he gets to the bit of the conversation that we should be having. And it's an amazing, it's an incredible process. When I was in the city, I was like, what is this, what is this coaching thing, you know, life coaching and all the rest of it. So but I was fed up. I was really bored of getting in my own way. And, and what we're building, I figured, was more important than Rob just like, running around in circles, obsessing around various things weren't serving him. And so he said, come on, in which ways have you not yet escaped the city? I was like, I've escaped the city. I live in a houseboat. I cut my own hair. Come on, don't give me that. And he's like, no, in your head, in your mindset, how have you not escaped? And it was a really good challenge. Um, whenever I feel the pressure that there's a should of how you should build a business, I'm back in the city. Whenever I feel the fear about failure or making a mistake, I'm back in the city. Whenever I um, need to know how something's going to turn out, I'm back in the city. Whenever I don't ship something because it needs to be perfect, I'm back in the city. And all of these things are not serving us in terms of how we're building our business. And then I look at the people who are coming to our events, and they've got the same mindset as me. And they're trying to figure out with their, right, with their logical side of their brains, how do I make this transition? But they're trying to solve a problem. You know that, that cliche about, well, A, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the other one is um, trying to solve a problem with the same tactics that have got you to where you are stuck is the definition of sanity. I completely murdered that quote, sorry. <laughs> but mainly, mainly it's around, you know what I'm talking about, mainly it's around should. Should is a really toxic word. I should do this, I should do that. I was very ungrateful to be unfulfilled in this corporate job. I should be here for five years. I should, 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 should. And... For me, it's those shoulds that are the block between most of us and the things that we, we want. We run two communities at the moment at the Escape School. Both are 100 people strong, and both are running for 100 days. And they're massively underpriced in terms of, you know, pay us a monthly fee and come to all our events for free. And the idea was, events are great, but they're quite transactional. You come, you have a beer, you get inspired, you bounce away. Sometimes after our weekend courses, people are even more depressed on the Monday than they were on the Friday because of the contrast. And so we formed these communities without really knowing what we were doing. And I use this as an anecdote to, uh, to try and bring some life into that example of the two mindsets. The corporate city mindset would have been like, all right, we need teachers, we need curriculum, we need brochures, it needs to be ready. We need 12 months and we need to, this thing to be right. And the mindset that I'm trying to like, sell you guys on is we just needed to start. We need to get 100 people to say, I'll sign up to this, sounds mad. Sounds like a revolution, I'm in. So the first community is called Founding Members. We had this empty corporate space. These guys paid a small fee a month. They actually came and helped us build the place. And they came to all our events for free. And it was such an uncomfortable experience for me because people have joined with Rob's expectation of, okay, tell me what to do with my life. And I'm like, are you kidding? I'm trying to figure this out. But as we came together as a group, and week on week listening to them and always feeling on the hook for their problems and taking responsibility and feeling, oh God, I wish we hadn't done this. It feels so uncomfortable. I grew and was stretched and understood so much more than I had if I hadn't shipped it. We hadn't shipped it. Um, the same with the startup tribe. 100 people, 100 days, at the end of it, you will launch a product or, or service to the rest of the community. And that's happened this week. Um, all of these things have been scrappy. And all of these things have been incredible as a result of being scrappy. So 
what are we all aiming at? I'm trying to get my head around this before I talk about how can you teach the unteachable? It has to be learnt through five years of making mistakes and being out there. And I try to get my head around. I look around me at the world, at people, maybe whose lives I envy, or maybe whose success I admire, or just seem to have it sorted. And you know that thing where you're comparing someone else's marketing, someone else's Twitter feed, to the inside of you, and as a result, it's like their external perspective, how you feel on the inside, okay, I feel shit about myself. Um, and you know, the more I've spoken to people who I admire, the more I've realized they feel exactly the same, but they haven't allowed it to stop them. Um, someone also said to me recently, don't compare yourself to anyone but previous versions of you. And then it's like, two years on, where was I? Go me, we're doing all right. You compare yourself to like other entrepreneurs in London, it's like, you know, you're constantly beating yourself up. So I look at these people and I'm like, okay, what is it? Um, the first thing is excellence. Like, anyone here feel like a generalist? I hate being a generalist because it's just like master of all trades, jack of none. Um, and excellence for me is when you find that thing that you would do if you weren't even paid to do it, and you do it when you're not being paid to do it, and you get really damn good at it, and you become useful to the world through that thing. Purpose, right? Fire in the belly. This thing matters, and I'm going to give it my all. Um, niche, like, the people who I look at have become very good at something very specific that they care about. They're also patient. They understand that it's going to take five years. And that's the other thing about the corporate mentality is like, okay, two months out, I want to be sorted. I want to be earning what I was, and I want to know, and it needs to be sorted. It's not how the world works, unfortunately. Um, for me, it's about making active choices. It's just crazy. You get someone who's 35 years old, they've jumped through 10 years of becoming a highly paid corporate lawyer, and they'll admit after two beers and in a safe environment, that they've never made an active decision for themselves. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff around acting with integrity, owning your own definition of success, and then taking responsibility. The main thing for me is that I thought that this transition, owning your career, creating life on your own terms, would, should be seamless. And like, you know, I've always worked hard in the past. I get the grades. This will work out. And the more I walk down this five-year journey towards realizing I need to work with a coach because I'm fed up with getting my own way, in my own way, the more I realize that discomfort isn't an annoying side effect of a journey towards nirvana, loud of milk and honey, meaning, independence, all the rest of it. Discomfort is the way. Discomfort is the sign that this thing is worth doing. And I hate that. And I sound like a masochist when I say it, right? Yeah. You know, it's a bit like a no fear slogan. Yeah, go do, feel the fear and do it anyway. It's not that. But the fear for me is a sign that it's worth it. And um, how the hell do you teach any of this? And that's my question. Um, I kind of have an answer. But um, I'd like to you know, open up to you guys Twitter, email, in the room afterwards. Um, because it's only through five years of feeling uncomfortable that I can talk to you guys about this. Month, five weeks into building my startup, you'd been like, I mean, you might be thinking this anyway, but especially then, you'd have been like, get off, Victoria, last creative mornings of, you got a fraud, the guy doesn't know anything. But the point is, that lived experience. So, okay, if I talk about what the escape school's been doing this year, it's been doing evening talks and weekend workshops. Um, and the problem with that is it was, trying to teach people about this new, new world that we want to get into with old world education. Sit there, be passive, listen, some coach, some instructor, some entrepreneur, how do I build a blog? That's not what we need to know. We can figure out most of the how. Um, and so by being uncomfortable and forming these two communities who have just culminated in December, we've had the privilege to notice that the magic is in the community. The magic is what happens when you get people together and create a safe environment for stuff to happen. And the like, control freak perfectionist Rob wants like, there to be bullet points and steps and frameworks and PowerPoint, actually. So like, you know, the management consultant in me is still there, like, post-it notes. But so this startup tribe has been incredible. It was unstructured, 100 people forming into groups, helping each other. Matt Trinetti, who's in the audience, escaped IBM to join me. Matt, put your hand up. This man took a sabbatical from IBM. They gave him seven months. It's incredible what you get when you ask for it. So he went meandering with purpose around Europe, built a, a blog, givelivexplore.com, did a TED talk on Say Yes to Your Adventure, created his own self-publishing company, went back to IBM. Guess how many days he lasted? <laughs> Ten. And through that journey into the unknown, 
I met him, I saw what he was building, and I was just like, this guy, you know, speaking my language, he could have no idea of what opportunities he was creating for himself on that journey. And now we're here together building this thing, and we noticed that we need to turn the entire school upside down. We need to stop trying to control things through talks and workshops. We need to form groups. We need to form communities of people, because so much of the answers is in the room, right? So many of these people have so much more experience than us at the center. And so here's our plan. People sometimes joke at our events, like it's a little bit like AA, so someone will stick their hand up and be like, I resigned today, and everyone else will cheer, and it's <laughs> really, it's great. Um, and so I was like, okay, okay, three A's, three A's, two A, A. Here, here's my three A's, and this is what I think is gonna work a lot better than what we've been doing to date. The first one is allies. When you feel like your mates, your colleagues, your parents, your partner don't get it, it's incredibly tough. When you're surrounded by like-minded people who are as insane as you, it becomes a lot easier. The second one is attitude, and I don't think you can teach attitude. So certainly that stuff I was talking about mindset, I could like write it down and give it to you in story form. You could read it and maybe intellectually get it, but you won't understand it to be true until you feel it. It's like a weather forecast. Like, it's gonna rain. Okay, fine, I'm not sure I need a weather forecast, don't believe you. But then it rains and you understand, okay, that's what they were talking about. So our challenge is to create an environment within which people can get out there and act, and that's my third A, so allies, attitude, and action. And within the context of a journey, which is like, you're gonna spend three months with us, you're gonna come every Tuesday night, and there'll be 50 other people in this group. There'll be some content, some storytelling, but most of this evening is about us working on ourselves and the plan. And at the end of these three months, there's gonna be an artificial deadline. No one's gonna, you know, you're not gonna get an F if you're not gonna do it. But you're gonna stand on stage on a closing ceremony and you're gonna articulate where you were at the beginning, what you've built for yourself, and where you're headed now. And for me, that is just so much more exciting in terms of empowering people to take responsibility for what is, frankly, a terrifying journey. Someone said to me the other day, most career people, so like, one day I woke up and I was like, am I a recruiter? Oh God, how did this happen? And another moment I was like, am I a career coach? How did this happen? Someone said to me the other day, most career coaches are selling like the nine steps to land of milk and honey, you know, no fear, no failure, no risk of failure. And someone said to me the other day, like, Rob, you, you guys are really honest about how hard this is. And I'm like, yeah, well, A, we've lived it ourselves and it's tough as hell. And B, what's the point of dressing it up? If it was easy, no one would be in this room. They'd just be off living their life of their dreams on their own terms. So that's what I think we need to do in order to get to where we want to get to, is embrace a bit of discomfort, surround ourselves by like-minded people, adopt a, an attitude and a mindset that's gonna serve us, and then just take one baby step after another. Um, thanks for having me. It's easier to change, to make brave transitions when you're in your 20s and 30s. You're less invested in a particular career path. And you also, for the most part, often have fewer responsibilities. You're less embedded. That said, when we started Escape the City, we said this is a community for young professionals who want to make changes. And we dropped the young within a week of launching. We've got so many emails from people saying, why are you being ageist? This is for us too. And we get so many people coming to our events who say, I'm 48, I'm 52, I'm trying to figure this one out. So it's an interesting one. We also get some pushback. People saying, I understand the concept, but there's friction. You guys are, you know, the average age of our team is 31. And sometimes it feels uncomfortable to be talking to someone with like maybe school fees, mortgages, all the rest of it about transition. So is it possible to transition at any stage? Absolutely. Um, do you want to work with someone who's 20 years younger than you on that? Maybe not, and that's your prerogative. Um, is it a millennial thing? Certainly, like, this idea of work being more than just a means to an end and 
a route to financial security and to have a comfortable life has sort of, I mean, from what I've seen in the last five years, it's exploded. Um, is it just a millennial thing? No, I don't think so. Um, if you think about what happened after 2007, 2008 in the economy, like in the early noughties, investment bankers, head fund traders, these are like the, that's the pinnacle. You leave Oxbridge, that's where you're aiming. And a lot of the leaders of some of our biggest institutions have been massively discredited over the last seven years. And I think it's not just people in their 20s and 30s who are looking at it and going, the way we're doing a lot of this stuff is really unhelpful. Is there another way? Um, but it is easier when you're five years into a consulting gig, a consulting career or an accounting career, to say, I'm going to take advantage of these opportunities. So for me, two things happened at once. A lot of the mainstream got discredited in various ways. You look at scandals, you look at lack of leadership, and you just think, is that the role model for me? And at the same time, technology just get, it would have been impossible to start at Escape the City 10 years ago. To have got a community of 180,000 people to be communicating with them on a daily basis. So these two things happened at the same time. Technology opened up the opportunity for people who were inquisitive enough to read the idea virus in their cubicle at work and just to keep walking until, until standing here in front of you today. And I think we all have that opportunity, no matter what stage we're at in our lives or careers. Yeah? Um, so I'm currently working on a book where I'm actually asking people, how have you done the tr transition? It's like, how long did it take you to build up your business? How much money did you make in the beginning? It's mm. like very pinpointed to like the how. Mm. And there are certain patterns where it's very much like, OK, um, those people who are working crazy hours. Mm. And like persistency did it once they did something small. Mm. And um, my question was, how far do you go with the people? Because what I would say afterwards is, you just have to start small. Mm. But then the question is, how much do you push them mm. at those workshops? So I think we all walk around thinking we need to learn how. Mm. And I don't think the how is open <coughs> what we need to know. Obviously, when you're making a plan, you're managing your finances, and you want to make a safe transition, then tactics help. But uh, I've certainly noticed this in myself. Like, you know, literally Googling how to make my startup not fail. You know, <laughs> we, we think, we, we behave, we all behave as if there's a secret toolkit. And once we have the secret, we'll be fine. And I think there are tactics and techniques that will save you time, money, and worry. But at the same time, it's not necessarily the how that we need to, it's, it's, the, it's the why and the what. What direction am I walking in and why am I doing it? Um, so, you, we're, you know, you're smart, you figure out how stuff's done. All of the information you could ever want is accessible to you. I don't think that's necessarily what you need to get unstuck, because we work on helping people get unstuck. Once you've got momentum, so res resigning's not that hard. What's really hard is building the thing on the other side of the resignation process. So I know what you're talking about. Is like, I think it's a transition. I think it can take years. I think, I was talking to Rob about, um, there's a 60 second clip on YouTube called Purity by the fashion designer Paul Smith. And he talks about, in the early days, this thing, this pure creative project, which, was, which he was protecting at all costs, but it was only 10% of his life. And the rest of the time, he's doing all this crap to pay for the purity. And so often, I think that's the case. So how often do we take people? At the end of these communities, be, people have been saying to us, please don't leave us. You know, we need to stay engaged in this community long term. So for us, it's what does that look like as you continue over a two-year journey? Because for me, year one was easy. Year one was like, I've got some savings. We can pay rent on a bit of revenue. Um, every new milestone was a high five moment. First bit of press, first revenue, first like human custom, human at a meetup saying, fix me. Um, year two got really hard, because then it became real. Payroll, um, pressure, fear of failure, all of that stuff. And so all I can say is, it comes back to surrounding yourself with people who are on a similar journey, uh, having a business partner. And um, certainly, I think I was a bit naive and potentially <coughs> enough plugged into the scene in terms of people who were living this life. And I think I could have got a lot from learning from other people who were slightly ahead of me. We were quite intimidated by, you know, we were over in West London at a kitchen table and like all oh, the startup noise coming out of uh, Shoreditch and Hall Street and just thought, we stay away from that. What's a startup? We're not even building a startup, are we, all of this? Um, but I think that community really helps. Sorry, really long answer. I'll try and keep them shorter. Yeah. Do you find that people are coming to you with things like marriages and relationships? <laughs> Problems. Or, 
Like, yeah, like transition, like there's a lot of, all the things you're striving. Yeah. I think we as a culture, world, have the same. Struggling with. Struggling with. Yeah. What should marriage look like? What should right. relationships look like? Yeah, that? yeah. Are no. people bringing that to the table? Sometimes. I mean, it comes out, right? So it's relevant, isn't it, in any decision? So I was, I was looking blank because I was just... You thought I was asking well. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, thought, I thought you were asking whether people come for, like, marriage advice and stuff. Um, but, yeah, so I think... <laughs> it's basically, when you're trying to figure out your career challenge, you're also figuring out your life stuff as well at the same time. And um, so in, what's incredible is my team is laughing at me so much over there. <laughs> what's amazing is... I don't know why it's... I'm, I'm, I don't know why it's... Amazing. Just, because, just because I'm not qualified to advise people about marriages. But, uh, yeah, correct, correct. So, sorry, let's get to the heart of it. Uh, uh, the question is, are people coming with marriage and life and family challenges as well as career challenges? Yes, yes they are. So like, there are people in the room who are going through divorces, there are people in the room who are getting married or are married. But I think your question is, how is that relevant to the career thing? No, I think you can create a parallel world, but not about like, uh, career transitions, but in marriage relationship Sim Similar dynamic. Well, the city is not just the city, right? It's, it's a you metaphor. Right. Yeah. Like, not be yeah. Which, you know, maybe in your case, the yeah. Correct. Correct. So I think the thing around change is the same. Like, one of our faculty is a psychologist, and his thing is the psychology of change. And I think no matter what you're changing, so there's a guy called Rob Archer, the career psychologist, and his concept, um, his central concept is something called experiential avoidance, which is that idea that the closer you get to something that you potentially want that scares you. If you back away from it, you feel relief, and it's self-reinforcing. So as a result, you can get stuck in various things that are unhelpful for you, be it a job or a relationship. Um, what's amazing about the environment that we've created and the community we've created is when people feel safe, they share everything. And as a result, they can help each other. So Rob doesn't have all the answers. That's not the role that we're playing. But when you get people together, and they can swap experiences. You know that thing where it's easy to give your friend relationship advice, but it's hard to give it to yourself? And, and that's one of the really exciting things. Yeah. I'm asked about marriage. <laughs> one of the, um, the things I'm kind of wondering is, Escape City seems almost like um, a solution to a, a problem that's happened. Wouldn't it be kind of worth maybe looking at the, at the beginning of the process, yeah. as you kind of touched on about education, mm. and about how students, kids get installed in their heads that this journey that they're going on. Yeah. And instead of maybe escape city becoming a solution avoid problem, avoid the city go straight to the beginning and, yeah. I, and, I, and it resonates for me because i was listening to a talk by ken robinson mm. and he was talking that it's not about the linear process you don't go in one end and come out the other yeah um and it's interesting to see that kind of dynamic where if you do allow kids to express their creativity go into something they want to do mm. they come out the end mm. being a lot happier mm. and not having that kind of feeling of their on one path, totally. one route. Totally. I mean, so the mindset that we we're talking about started there, started that environment. Yeah. I'm um, well, just wondering whether it's, could you be, you know, working with, I mean, with the potential with politicians, governments, education, you know, would that be... So one of the things... Um, so, so A, yes. <coughs> sort of second answer is such a small team trying to do one thing well. Um, but I agree, I think it's such a big problem. And when I think about Escape the City, we're just part of a bigger cultural conversation around education and work. Um, for me, I, the, the thing that I'm interested in is at what point does the city start taking notice and ring me up and say, why are all my good people leaving help? And that has started happening, which is one step back up the train of the problem, but it goes even further. So the founding membership group that I talked about that have formed at the Escape School, out of that community has come a project which is aimed at helping school and uni leavers on the direction thing. So one of the frustrations people say is I was never told anything helpful at any stage. And so I just got in a box. I paid off my student debt and I started climbing a ladder. Um, we, we've worked with some school groups and it's been really fun um, being quite 
subversive and unconventional in terms of all the advice they're hearing from their teachers and their parents. Um, I think it's probably a different business, or maybe it's something we could do if we ever got further. Um, but I agree completely. It goes really deep. And that's why I said, like, you know, we've got a job board and we've got a, an education business. But actually, when you pull at the thread, um, it goes so, far, so much deeper. Like, you can't teach this stuff. And a lot of the pro you're not going to solve these problems by getting another job on a job board. So sometimes I look at what we're building and I'm thinking, OK, this is fine, but it only goes like one step, one tenth of the way, or whatever it is. It's such a big problem. Yeah. Um, I like to know with there's people within the community. How do you help people get there? Look, I know you have to get there on your own. I'm at a stage where I've had a realization, mm. transition. My brother works in business and finance. First job out of college. He's I know him. He's been in the wrong job, wrong job for a long time. Mm. He says, if I had a startup idea, I would do it, but mm. I don't have one. Mm. Um, how do you recommend? How do you recommend? encouraging like you know when someone goes to a and they see it in a friend actually that person needs help how do you encourage members encouraging other people to get in who are a bit where they you worry that if you bring them in it's going to be resistant dip, um, it's also going to be difficult for them it's going to turn their world upside down they're going to hate you for it. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no, we get a lot of people's frustrations because we sort of represent an alternative and when people feel like it's not possible they can get quite upset, you know, this is childish, unrealistic, ungrateful, you know, idealistic. I think um, you have to be ready. Um, Matt, Matt um, did a TED talk called Say Yes to Your Adventure, and it's on that idea of the hero's journey, which is the first thing is the call, the call to adventure, and the second thing is the decision to make a change. And the hard thing isn't being um, in a corporate job that's just okay and you're not that happy with it. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, if you're miserable, you will change. Your body will make you change. You will just be so upset that you will change. It's the comfortable disillusion, like this is fine, but that's really rough. Comfort kills ambition, which is just like, oh, this is fine, but it's not the dream. Um, so you could give him my book, The Escape Manifesto, and see if the propaganda works. Uh, oh, cool. Thank you. Or you could come along to a story, um, like Monday evening, come and hear an entrepreneur talk about the journey and see if it resonates. Stick around and chat with us. Thank you so much, Rob. This is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's fun. I'm sorry. Talk forever. <laughs>